Thank you so much, Manoi, and thank you to everyone else who is uh, supporting uh, well today's uh, meeting as well as uh, Venerable Chanda's retreat and um, all the beautiful things that are happening in the UK. I'm very delighted to see uh, Anokampa uh, going from a bikuni project to an actual vihara and uh, to a growing and flourishing community. It's really delightful and beautiful. So you can always recollect your own goodness whenever you see um, yeah, this miracle of Dhamma flourishing. It wouldn't be happening if you wouldn't be practicing and supporting it and um, creating all the conditions for everyone to um, partake in all this benefit. So we can start maybe with a bit of um, meditation practice and then from there we'll um, talk a little bit about uh, some dhamma maybe. All right, so you can get into a comfortable seated position if you're not already sitting down. And taking a few deep breaths. And start relaxing the entire body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. Releasing any tension we might perceive in the body. And releasing any tension we might perceive also in the mind, in the heart. Any little anxiety that might be holding us up. We can just allow ourselves to let it all go. We have nothing to do, nowhere to go. Nothing to hold on to. Nothing to think. We can just allow ourselves to just be here. in the present moment. As perfect or as imperfect as it may be. We can just embrace it for what it is.
And we can now slowly bring our attention to the breath. Watching every single in-breath and out-breath with careful attention. looking at the breath like it was the most interesting thing in the world. We keep enhancing our awareness of every in-breath and out-breath. Without forcing the breath. Without altering the breath. But simply looking at the breath. Just as it is. trying to know it rather than to change it. And we know if the breath is short, we know if the breath is long. If it's subtle or if it's coarse. Observing how the air enters the nostrils, fills up the lungs, and slowly comes out without us having to do anything at all.
We just keep observing this natural process of breathing. Tranquilizing the entire body with every in-breath and out-breath. as though the breath was massaging our inner body. We keep tranquilizing the body, becoming more and more aware of the entire body with every in-breath and out-breath. And as we're keeping our mindfulness of the body and of the breath, as we keep cultivating this mindfulness of breathing and this mindfulness of the body, we can also observe the pleasantness of the body. This pleasant feeling that comes with a tranquil body. And a tranquil mind. And we can welcome this pleasantness, this happiness. We 
without being scared of it, but instead embracing it and cultivating it.
And as we're coming closer to the end of our meditation together, we can take the opportunity to look at the mind and look at the qualities of tranquility, of peacefulness, of happiness that have increased during this period of sitting meditation. And we can acknowledge how this practice is leading us towards a decrease of suffering and an increase of wholesome qualities of mind. No matter how difficult it has been to keep our mindfulness of breathing, our mindfulness of the body, no matter how scatter-minded we thought we were, we can still acknowledge how less scatter-minded we feel now, how peace, more peaceful we feel now. And with this awareness, we can slowly bring our hands in Anjali. And we can say together three times sadhu and come out of meditation practice. Sadhu. 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 Right. This time, if you need to stretch a little bit your body and legs and uh, find another position, seated position or standing position, maybe. All right, and at uh, this moment, we can uh, pay homage to our original teacher, the reason why we're gathered here today, Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Bhutam Dhammam Sankham Namasami So today, if I remember correctly, Aya Chanda had um, invited me to speak a little bit about uh, the traveling that we've been doing in Italy and uh, also the encounters with, uh, uh, with different Catholic monastics uh, in, uh, in the peninsula where I'm originally from. So... Uh, yeah, for those who don't know, I'm originally from Italy, hence my clunky English. <laughs> I was born and bred there, but I've been living in uh, the past decade, um, actually past 15 years, it's adding up, <laughs> uh, 
here in the United States. So I normally have a bit of an Italy English going on. <laughs> I think I've, I've come to a point where I speak poorly both languages, both English and Italian poorly. <laughs> kind of happens when, uh, when you live abroad for a while. And uh, for several different reasons, even though uh, the monastery that Bantesudazo and myself um, have established uh, is here in the United States for several different reasons um, that mostly include actually the health of my parents. I started uh, after the pandemic um, going to back to my home country for periods of time. And um, this has been a very interesting interesting experience on so many different uh, different levels. One, of course, is seeing actually, you know, the, the first noble truth um, at its core, um, you know, the teachings of what is the definition of dukkha, uh, what is the definition of suffering that, that the Buddha encourages us to see. Uh, so old age is dukkha, uh, sickness is dukkha, uh, death is dukkha, right? And then, of course, all the getting in touch with uh, what we dislike is to can be separated from what we love and what we like what is pleasing to us what is dear to us is to come and so obviously whenever we are dealing with aging parents with um, parents who are um, sick uh, we get to see this this noble first noble truth really really in depth uh, right and um, so this has been very much a part of of my, of my journey but at the same time it's also been very interesting going back um, after over a decade in the United States uh, back to my home country and um, and also connecting with a lot of different people who are interested in the Dhamma or have been practicing the Dhamma for a while and come from my sort of same uh, background same cultural background and um, and from a, a place being in a place with a millenary history of monasticism. Uh, so that has been, been very, very interesting, you know, to, to go there as a Samana and uh, traveling around in a place where everybody knows that I'm a Samana. <laughs> Maybe not immediately um, understanding what type of Samana, what type of contemplative, what type of monk, uh, but Still, you know, there is a sense this is a monk, right? Um, I am seeing a monastic. This is someone who has who is um, a religious person of some sorts. Um, so it's been quite interesting because it's very, very different from my experience of being a, a monk, being a monastic here in the United States, where there is not really a history of, of um, monasticism and um, also, the the country as we know it today uh, is relatively new. Obviously, there was also there is actually still um, a millenary culture in the United States, but uh, for several different historical reasons that we all know, most of it has been wiped out. And so, the majority of the experience that one has <clears throat> in the United States is very new in comparison to the rest of the world. Uh, or in the Americas in general, everything is somewhat new. And also, obviously, monasticism is somewhat new. <laughs> A few people here and there, you know, obviously, um, different immigrants come with, with their baggage of culture and knowledge. And, uh, of course, there was also, there have been Catholic monastic communities in particular in, in the United States for a while, but they were kind of sparse and kind of uh, very small. Uh, overall, as opposed to in Italy, it's been growing, growing, growing. Um, in that really, you know, somewhat, um, um, the characteristic of the of the religion. There are so many, so many actually different monastic communities. There are so many different robes actually within Catholicism. So many different ways to be to be a monastic that I'm actually learning right now uh, as a Buddhist monastic rather than um, uh, when I was uh, growing up there. And so it's very interesting to have this experience of going around uh, the country and also 
also understanding the fourth messenger, right? So the Buddha in the in the story of how the Buddha, you know, essentially started his um, his um, his path, started his journey, um, looking for for awakening. Obviously, we we know about the the story of the the, the four messengers, right? So. Uh, first, uh, the messenger of old age, of sickness, and then the, uh, so the, these three messengers that I spoke a little bit uh, about earlier. And then there is the fourth messenger, right? When he sees actually the Samana. It can be very, very depressing when we actually really realize that we're all subject to old age. We're all subject to sickness. We're all subject to death. We're not exempt from it, right? And everybody that is that we love um, is subject to old age sickness and death and they're not exempt from that you know we can keep that delusion going on that everybody else is um <laughs> subject to this but not me not my mom not my dad not my brother not my sister not my children right we can somewhat sometimes kind of um yeah, just have the luxury to to be in this delusion. But then there comes a time in, in life where we we really have to come to terms with um, with all of this. And it can be very, very, very depressing. And this is a universal experience of suffering. This is why the, the teachings of the Buddha are timeless. This is why the Dhamma has that quality of timelessness. This is why the, the Dhamma has that quality of also coming, inviting us to, to come and see for ourselves, right? It's no different 2,500 years ago in ancient India than it is today in uh, West Orange, New Jersey, where I am right now, or in Italy, where I was before, or... Uh, in the UK where you are right now, right? Uh, it doesn't doesn't really matter. That is the the condition, the experience that we all have. Uh, it can be quite tragic. Um, in the suttas, we also see that the Buddha is said to say that when we have an encounter with such deep suffering, usually two are the kind of the routes. Either one goes um, into takes on a, a spiritual path. Or one goes entirely insane <laughs> right so hopefully we're in the uh, former <laughs> route we all took the spiritual path and uh, staying clear from the insanity but we can also um i think all of us relate to to that aspect of why one could go insane one could go completely astray uh, when having such a deep experience of suffering and so we see how perhaps also, you know, the Buddha really coming into a full understanding of the first noble truth. Then um, had to also see a bit of a, of something, needed another messenger also himself, even though he had all these perfections, all these paramis had to see a form, something that uh, was a bit of a key um, of a way to come out of this predicament. And so we, we talk about the fourth messenger, the messenger of the Samana, the messenger of the monastic, when he saw someone that was actually living in a, in a way that was a little bit different from everyone else, someone who was taking, um, making a choice that was going against the stream rather than with the stream, right? And so this has been the experience uh, that uh, somewhat I, myself and, you know, with the other venerables, I, I felt really strongly actually being in, in Italy of, of embodying this fourth messenger and not because I was giving uh, Dhamma talks there, even though I did. So not necessarily I'm speaking with, the, with people who were Buddhist or um, who were interested really just the experience of walking around uh, throughout the country. It's very interesting because even though, you know, it's uh, there's this incredible Catholic um, monastic tradition in Italy for so long uh, these days, as with the rest of the world, uh, it's been, it's slowly dying out. So there are less and less monastics, less and less um, Catholic um, monastics of all sorts, less friars, less nuns, less 
less everything, less priests too, actually, uh, that are not even monastics. But even the priests are a little bit um, less. Uh, there's more churches that are closing or more churches that are turned into actually right now more museums there's a ticket it's actually been really weird uh to come back to italy after so long and for the first time to see actually tickets to enter churches because they're not anymore used as spiritual places but they are becoming kind of um a bit of a museum of uh, something that people used to do back in the back in the day right and that was very shocking for me to see because i had never seen um, anything <laughs> been remotely close to a ticket to enter um, a church um, so or I had never seen groups of tourists uh, coming and like yelling in a, in a church using it as a secular place rather than a place of of practice and bear in mind that I did not grow up Catholic so there was not a you know kind of um, my parents were my dad is atheist and my mom um is uh is a non-practicing catholic which always meant more of a non-practicing than a catholic <laughs> so it's uh it's very interesting that even though i didn't have some um you know religious um just feeling it was really quite shocking to see actually these places that i recognized as um, places where people were had been practicing um or had a, a spiritual practice um, are somewhat turning into something different and obviously it's not like that everywhere uh, but that's a little bit of trend that that is uh, somewhat increasing and what really was beautiful was actually to see uh, the happiness of people whether they were catholic uh, or not catholic or something in between <laughs> the happiness of um of just people whether they were living in cities or whether they were living in towns, to all of a sudden see these um, these samanas, these um, contemplatives show up. <laughs> I was traveling with uh, Pante Sudaso and um, Samaniravata, the um, um, novice uh, here at Empty Cloud um, Monastery. And last time I was traveling also with Aya Pramavara and uh, Pante Kusala. Um, other monastics that periodically we bring and each time actually it's been the same experience of entering in these towns and seeing sort of the happiness and surprise of people that are um, all of a sudden seeing these these mendicants these renunciants and it's quite interesting because uh, also our new um, Samanera here at Empty Cloud Monastery is 19 years old so many, many folks would see him and it's kind of, you know, there's so many stereotypes of Gen Z, right? <laughs> that they only like, they're only constantly on their phones or they're materialistic and so forth. And instead here is there's this Gen Z <laughs> um, young um, lad who is actually has left everything behind and is so inspired to, yeah, to just, you know, go around and, live uh, this mending and lifestyle but you know without giving any dhamma talks once again without actually sitting down and um, teaching people but rather just living the holy life uh, holding both dhamma and vinaya right at heart and going pindapata um, whenever possible and in uh, into the towns it's been so interesting how all of this has been kind of giving a Dhamma talk in and of itself. It has given so many opportunities for people to, to literally practice uh, practice giving, but also practice renunciation. This is one of the incredible blessings, you know, like sometimes, uh, I, like a, actually a memory, a recent memory that I have is uh, going Pinta Pada and, um, and being there with the bull. And at a certain point, this mother came uh, up with uh, these two her two children and uh, they were trying to put some money in the bowl and uh, we had to thank her and uh, refuse uh, explaining that we don't handle money that we can accept only food and she had just brought some some food you know for herself uh, from a shop and she gave us that food right she put it in uh, her sandwich and and the oatmeal and she put it in the bowl 
And her children were like, Aster, what are you doing? <laughs> and she said, well, I just gave them the food that we were supposed to eat at home <laughs> and left. And it was just so beautiful because it just, um, once again, holding this form without doing anything except following the Vinaya, um, this form itself created the conditions for the mother to not only give, but to practice renunciation and also to teach her children the blessings of, of renunciation, the happiness that comes from, from letting go, from giving something that we need, we want for ourselves to give it to others, to perhaps these like weird shaven head uh, folks that are not even, you know, practicing your religion or a religion that you're even interested in. And so many other folks, you know, just uh, actually thanking us <laughs> for being there to accept offerings. That's also been very, very interesting, especially the Catholics. <laughs> they were so, so thankful, uh, so happy to see us. And the more and they would ask us about our precepts, uh, they would um, inquire like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, you don't handle money. Oh, that's wonderful. Amazing, amazing. Oh, you don't store food? Amazing. How wonderful, spectacular. <laughs> oh, you don't eat afternoon? This really impresses Italians. <laughs> it's like, absolutely incredible. <laughs> Lovely. So, you know, all of these different, uh, different precepts, there is a, really like a high respect of renunciation. So most of the feedback actually is, uh, has been very positive. And I was wondering, you know, sometimes in, in the US, it's not really like that. <laughs> sometimes people are like, hmm, okay. I mean, sure, uh, we believe in freedom of religion. <laughs> You're doing some really weird things, <laughs> but all right. <laughs> There's kind of like a little bit of a diffidence or perhaps maybe some people telling us, uh, which is actually wasn't terribly different also at the time of the Buddha sometimes, or oh, even the Buddha got that feedback. Yeah, maybe you should like think about getting a job. <laughs> I, maybe you should go and work for that sandwich rather than um, being there and, uh, and accepting that, uh, that sandwich, right? So there can be a little bit of a different um, different attitude and this has got me very much to thinking so much of um, why is it that is so different in my home country and it's not obviously that you know some people are better than others or some people get it more than others but rather that you know everything is dependent to origination and so where is this coming from well it's coming from obviously from this uh, tradition of samanas that have been there for for so so long and so this gave me a bit of a, a better insight also of um yeah the some of the suttas where we see actually i'm thinking perhaps of uh uh, the Siha Sutta, where um, uh, there is this follower of the Jains uh, that meets the Buddha and at um, a certain point converts and, and starts, um, you know, supporting converts. <laughs> so it goes to the Buddha, takes uh, the three refuges um, with, the, uh, with the Buddha, becomes a follower, a lay follower of the Buddha. Um, understands, you know, sort of the wrong view that perhaps um, the the previous sect was holding and uh, finds the right view with the Buddha. But the Buddha tells him, you've been supporting that sect for so long, right? You've been supporting um, uh, the Lichalis for so long, you should keep on, keep on supporting them. And you can also support the Buddhist Sangha, right? So you don't just support the Buddhist Sangha and then <laughs> stop supporting um uh the other sect but keep on supporting them and it's kind of interesting right because we're like why is that why is that so why would the buddha actually invite uh give that invitation or um or suggest you know not to stop uh the support for perhaps a sect that you know does some good things but also has some some wrong views views there, right, from the, the Buddhist perspective. 
And at the very beginning, you know, I have to say that when I had read that suit, I was like, oh, maybe, you know, it's just to, to keep in good terms with everyone. <laughs> you know, as Buddhists, we have actually this really good reputation, right? The Dalai Lama is very good with every, every single religion, right? So it's like very good PR instead of, <laughs> instead of like, oh, only this is true, everything else is wrong, which he also like suggests, um, teaches us numerous times not to have, not to hold that view, uh, but to actually, you know, kind of be a little bit more, more inclusive and be a little bit more understanding, or at least understand why we think that, uh, you know, the Dhamma is actually, is true. What is it that we, why do we think what we think is true, right? And so to have a bit of that approach rather than rejecting everything that everybody else is um, is saying to actually be a little bit more to, to ponder it a little bit more and not be extremist so I was like well, well what is this and I think that um, you know of course there is the not trying to um, take that sort of stance of that position but there's also fundamentally the recognition of the samana the recognition that anyone who is essentially cultivating you know uh practicing a renunciant lifestyle is fundamentally creating a fertile soil a fertile soil for then people to have access to then the dhamma ultimately uh, a fertile soil for the practice of renunciation uh, you know, the Buddha, in fact, was capable of doing everything that he was capable of doing because he actually was born in a place in ancient India where people were not all Buddhists, obviously, right? He was the he was the Samasam Buddha, but there were he was surrounded by people who were practicing um, as samanas in so many different ways. They were practicing, following different disciplines, uh, following different religions, uh, we, may, we may call them different views, different ascetic practices, but actually this created a very good condition to uh, fertile soil, essentially, uh, and through which one could grow uh, in the Dhamma, right? And so it's, it's very interesting to see that parallel today after 2,500 years. I was like, wow, I think this is kind of like the closest <laughs> in a way uh, in Italy to, to having a bit of a, like a modern contemporary version of, of perhaps how it was when the Buddha was um, in, uh, in India 2,500 years ago. So to be a you know, the Buddhist monastic in Italy right now, it's, it's very much like that. There's not really that many Buddhist monastics, actually very, very few. And definitely you don't encounter them in on the streets. Um, but there's lots of you know different monasteries here and there that we have gone and like met, and um also the lay people recognizing us and perhaps giving us also some feedback in our in our practice. You know, some of the lay people were asking us if we were Franciscans, for example. <laughs> and so I learned. Uh, actually the similarities of St. Francis with a story of the Buddha even. Uh, St. Francis had this story of, you know, being, uh, growing up in a really wealthy family and at a certain point giving everything up in order to practice uh, like Jesus, like renunciate, like um, um, someone who was more close to the poor rather than uh, to, to the rich and cultivate the richness that is in the heart. And so he started wearing these, um, this sack, <laughs> this kind of potato sack um, robe, uh, gave all of his belongings to the poor and actually is still up to this day in that order in order to join the order of the Franciscans one is expected to take all of the, his um, or hers, um, their belongings, essentially, and not give them to the order, not give them to the Catholic Church, but actually give them to the poor. I find this so delightful. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> We're thinking about uh, putting that in for empty cloud monastery as well, if you want to ordain. <laughs> You should not give anything to any Buddhist organization, including empty cloud. You give everything to the poor. How lovely is that? It's just such a beautiful act of dana. And um, yeah, and then started living the holy life, going actually pindapat, 
so in Italian, it's called Bacuesto, so receiving anything that was given. We're also up until 50 years ago, actually a lot of active um, uh, active uh, monastics that would actively go on alms round. So some of the elderly people would remember that. Those were also some people who thanked us and were like, oh, we remember the people who would come on alms round, the monastics. Oh, how beautiful that. doesn't matter, you're Buddhist, who cares? <laughs> so happy I can um, give this donation. So it's very interesting, right, to see these parallels to go and, and see that. And also uh, for women uh, to also understand it, some other parallels that actually, both of the beauty of um, the, the form uh, that exists also in other traditions, um, like the female form. So um, the, the same exact thing, but also the how it sometimes has not been the same exact thing how oh, sometimes it has actually been a little bit um, try to um, be controlled because uh, it was a little bit inconvenient to have actually, uh, well, anyone practice the holy life, but even more so women uh, when uh, we were, you know, when living in a patriarchal society. So it was very interesting to go in and visit some of the, of the Franciscan um, uh, female monastics, and I'm sharing actually uh, the story of uh, Santa Chiara, uh, Saint Killer, I think you say in English. And uh, she was, um, you know, she had met Saint Francis and she decided to do exactly the same thing. And so actually the, you know, the Franciscan friars are this in between, because I also learned the different nuances in Catholicism. So usually the monastics um, are the ones that are very cloistered. So they usually are, you know, in one space, in one place. Um, and then there are, you know, the, um, the actual friars who are just doing a lot of friars or nuns that are actually doing this active sort of role in society. But the Franciscan friars have this like mix of contemplative and active uh, and engaged sort of with society practice, which also makes them very similar to uh, what we call, you know, Buddhist um, Buddhist monks, uh, very similar to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis um, form that we see in early Buddhism. So there's kind of in between, you know, we we have all these rules that put us in touch with the lay people that have that create this engagement with the lady we can't just be hermits we can't be independent but at the same time there's also an encouragement and actually in seclusion there's an encouragement in um, cultivating the mind there is a con there, there is a invitation yeah to um, cultivate right a samadhi and that requires a bit of a bit of separation right from lady rather than being constantly uh, of it all. So the Franciscans have a, a bit of this balance. And uh, so uh, St. Clara Santa Chiara decided she wanted to essentially embrace the same life that was accessible to, um, to St. Francis. And uh, so she, in the establishment of the order, she actually, uh, they were telling us back in Italy, I didn't know her story, that um, you know, she asked to go forth, she asked to become a renunciant, and um, the Pope uh, really wanted her just to uh, be cloistered. So she was like, he was like, okay, well, I allow you to, you know, to practice the teachings of St. Francis, to practice in this way, but you'll have to take this vow of being cloistered. You cannot go out. You cannot uh, engage in a sort of more charika practice. You cannot engage in the, in the practice in the wilderness. And I give you this pri privilege uh, of being actually protected uh, to be in this, um, in your monastery, so nothing can happen to you. And uh, St. Clair uh, wrote to the Pope and uh, begged him and was like, uh, may I have the privilege of having no privileges? May you please allow me to just live the holy life, just being free. Uh, but unfortunately, he denied it. <laughs> so the, the only way that the Clarisse, the uh, St. Clair order, was able to even exist was if she took the vow of being cloistered. 
And so now the, the monastics there, uh, the cloister monastics are having these conversations again of going like, well, you know, can we actually <laughs> live in the way that St. Uh, Clair actually wanted for us to live? Can we remove this? And there are some orders that are doing that. It's also very interesting that there are some orders, some monastic orders in Italy that I haven't met just yet, uh, but they're having gender inclusive uh, monasteries. Uh, so throughout the peninsula. And so next time I'm planning on visiting some of them, and it's like, oh, how very interesting. You know, now there's all these different also gender inclusive monasteries uh, popping out in uh, Theravada, obviously Empty Cloud Monastery being one of them. Uh, but also uh, Newbury Monastery in Australia um, with the blessing of Ajahn Brahm. And um, there's also another monastery that I'm aware of in New Zealand. So it's very interesting that there's a bit of this momentum. We're a little bit more worldwide. The Italians maybe are a little bit, <laughs> or the Catholics are a little bit more focused in Italy. I'm not sure. <laughs> Perhaps in South America as well. Yeah, very interesting to see to see all of that. Um, but also to see the sort of historical problems that there are. What is very fascinating is actually that in Buddhism, it's rather than kind of doing a bit of progress, it's actually about going a little bit more at the roots. Like we have a bit of a, the problem is actually the modernity rather than the, than the past. Because we see that in fact, these problems, um, you know, in the, in the early communities weren't weren't there when we see the when we read the suttas when we see um, the experience as told by the teris you know in the terigata it's uh it's essentially a privilege of having no privileges right it's, that's the story uh that's what the the buddha designed uh, for us all uh, whether it's male uh, monks or female monks uh, we all kind of have the same sort of encouragement from the buddha of, um, of really understanding that what we normally consider privileges are not privileges. But then throughout, you know, the history, we start forgetting that's kind of the nature of things, right? The nature of, of, the, of the unenlightened mind and the nature of just being more separated from the Samsung Buddha. So it's just beautiful to see uh, the you know, to actually understand a little bit better how to depersonalize it, to also not think, oh, this is just a problem that we have in Buddhism, but rather go, oh, okay, this is a bit of a problem everywhere. So when I was talking with the Catholic sisters, they were like, oh, we thought this was only a problem of Catholicism. I was like, oh, no, no, no worries. <laughs> Good company. <laughs> The whole, the whole world is a little town. We all have, you know, same sort of, yeah, greed, hatred, and delusion. It kind of manifests in <laughs> different shapes and forms. But when we can identify that, then it stops becoming something so concrete, so, so real, so consistent. Um, and it's something that we can actually see it for what it is, you know. So greed, hatred, and delusion, hmm, not useful. I can, I can put it down. Um, this is a burden, like I don't need it. And instead one needs to be cultivated and we can go back to the dumb mind instead of getting so <laughs> wrapped up in our heads and or also trying to fight with this idea of like, oh, why aren't things in a different way? What well, they could not be in a different way. <laughs> but, but our life can be in a different way. Our choices can be in a different way that we have agency and we can always decide to to act in accordance with Dhamma and, and see what the Buddha pointed out for us. So this is a little bit of a disjointed <laughs> stream of consciousness about uh, the topic. <laughs> so at this time, maybe if you have any questions or thoughts and uh, we can take it from there. Yeah, Terry, may I ask you to unmute, please? Hello, thank you. I found your discussion, discourse, fascinating. Um, can you give some give us some idea of how you came to Buddhism yourself? And the reason I ask is I'm Irish and I come from an intensely Catholic upbringing and my journey into buddhism was 
well I'd, I'd like to hear your what your journey was um <laughs> that, you say the catholicism got in the way <laughs> Well, Terry, thank you so much for uh, for your question. Yeah, um, actually, I have to say that uh, once again, even though I was born and bred in Italy, obviously I was baptized because uh, <laughs> that's kind of, I think everybody gets baptized in Italy. It's just a sort of rite of passage in Catholic countries. But as I mentioned, my parents weren't really uh, practicing. And, you know, I think that was a bit my generation uh, and below uh, are the generations that had, you know, the first sort of non-secular, uh, sorry, the first sort of more secular parents where perhaps they're, they're culturally Catholic, but not really. Yeah, they didn't really pass us anything onwards. Uh, maybe we have some, um, I grew up with a kind of, I think Catholic values, uh, but they were presented to me in a secular way. And actually I felt that to be a great support for Buddhist practice. Um, now I'm starting to identify where, where my parents um, brought, uh, where my parents got you know, their sort of morality from and uh, how that helped me, for example, understand the Dhamma better in a way, actually the, the idea of having you know, the sense, at least in, in the form of Catholic uh, Catholicism that we have in Italy, there is very much a sense that, you know, you don't get, for example, saved by faith alone, right? Which can be instead of a view that some sects here of Christianity here in the United States might hold. Um, so the idea that actually you have to also do good deeds <laughs> in order to get good results and that's kind of like an understanding you know and if you do bad deeds you're going to get bad results so to speak so that kind of translated really well actually further on for me to um, understand karma a little bit better at least it wasn't that much of a stretch actually I had a secular version of it you know nobody actually really spoke about paradise and hell <laughs> with my parents but they always told me you know you have to do these good deeds in order to get good results and then I was like okay yeah actually good karma bad karma I can see that and I can also use these as tools to to analyze the mind this being said um aside from the kind of basic up upbringing um yeah spirituality or religion never really played that big of a role I actually thought uh it was pretty obsolete and antiquated and also living in big cities in Italy it was just not really relevant none of my peers spoke about religion went to church and whenever I was exposed to the church I was exposed to the sort of of less inspiring sides of Catholicism, the ones that usually, um, yeah, I mean, not the atrocious ones that we read on the news, but more kind of the politics uh, that we read in the news. And so the, or the misconduct maybe, or the less spiritual sides of the, of the religion, which is not terribly different actually than the, the majority of, you know, uh, the peers that I know from Asia that perhaps live in Bangkok, <laughs> right, or live in uh, big cities in Asia that also, you know, are becoming more and more disillusioned with Buddhism precisely for the same reasons. It's kind of like, well, this is a little bit, mm, you know, not very relevant to my life. I see a lot of contradictions. I see actually a lot of abuse of power. I see a lot of, yeah, just not nothing that that can bring uh, to my life. So mostly, um, actually, when my grandparents died at the age of 10, my grandfather died at the age of 10, I became agnostic officially. And uh, I kind of studied all sorts of religions from the age of 10 to 13. However, I could, I, I remember getting a lot of books and kind of coming to the conclusion that there's, there was no sort of way to, to have a sense that there was kind of a god or no god <laughs> if this was this way or this other way that everybody's had a bit of a, a particular view and I couldn't there was there was no convincing thesis so I just kind of closed all the books 
and then uh, went on a pursuit of happiness. And obviously, in um, usually these days, in the past decades, you know, usually, um, yeah, there's there's kind of like more worldly pursuits that are pointed out as vehicles for happiness. And so I was very ambitious always. I was very ambitious. I wanted to not only have a job that I liked, I wanted to have a job that I loved. I didn't want to just with I wanted to be like madly in love <laughs> I didn't want to have just kind of friends that I grew up with I want to have like my perfect friends and um and I actually kind of accomplished all of that <laughs> multiple times so I I moved you know a lot of different places for me to be I went to also London and from London I went to uh, the U.S. and it was this constant pursuit of happiness and I did touch happiness here and there, but it was just not long lasting. And at a certain point, I thought there was something really wrong with, with myself. And I had already encountered Buddhism in all of this, but I think I, I wasn't quite ready. I was one of the first time I went to a Buddhist monastery. I remember, you know, I was actually really fascinated by the Vinaya of the monastics and uh, by just the geniusness of the of the form and of the that the Buddha created, all of those things really captured my attention. I thought um, it was also yeah the most fascinating religion I had seen. The fact that you know it encouraged um, you to question everything. I remember picking up this book, uh, this Zen book that says when you think you've seen the Buddha, kill the Buddha, which is really shocking for us Theravadans, but. Uh, <laughs> for the zen folks you know they like to be a bit provocative and i remember going like oh wow this is like goes beyond dogma like it's actually so anti-dogmatic that it even tells you to question you know the, the actual founder of the Buddha, <laughs> of the religion or uh or to question the pillars to question your idea of what it is so that really i found wow mind-boggling but at the same time i was like oh yeah, there's suffering, but there's also a lot of good things in life. <laughs> and then I remember thinking, I'm pretty sure that if I accomplish this, 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 and this in the United States, I'm going to be happy. So then once I accomplished them, I remember going on this retreat to Bauna Society, this monastery here in um, in the United States. And that's where I met Dante Sutazo. He was leading uh, one of the retreats there. And, and he said, uh, everything is inherently unsatisfying. And in that moment, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> that's why I'm still not happy. Uh, it's, I was trying to find happiness in something that is not reliable. So I think in that moment, I, you know, the, the Dhamma invited me to come and see for myself. And I saw for myself. And, and then I was like, all right, this is kind of had a bit of that taste, being there, being done, whatever I could do. And but I haven't really tried this out. And so that started, you know, my, uh, my foray into, into Buddhist practice. And um, yeah, and I went from 0% to 100%. So a little bit like that. <laughs> and, and yeah, and after three months of meeting Bhante Sutazo, I started a Buddhist organization with him and uh, started living like a renunciant. I quit my job, I quit everything that I was doing. And uh, then two years later, I, or three years later, I can't remember now anymore. I'm, yeah, three years later, I ordained. Um, and here I am today. So, <laughs> but I have to say that now that I'm meeting, you know, the monastic communities and Catholicism, um, I'm learning a lot more about what actually the religion is about. And I have a big appreciation for all the brothers and sisters back home that are really truly practicing the teachings of Jesus. And, um, you know, it's very different sometimes or very similar sometimes to what I am doing. Um, and it's okay. Like, I'm actually really happy to appreciate their practice without wanting for it to be exactly like mine and vice versa. And I'm actually learning also so many things from them. You know, they have like, for example, this Dana Parami, it's crazy. I mean, actually we can learn all Buddhists so we can learn a lot from the Dana Parami of the Catholics. I even thought about it myself because sometimes they give us hospitality in their monasteries. Um, and 
The Benedictine order, for example, has this practice of welcoming everyone like they were Jesus. And not only, you know, monastics from different traditions, every lay person that knocks at their door, they have this practice of uh, welcoming them, hosting them, like as if they were Jesus Christ. How beautiful. I was like, wow, I thought I was generous, but you know, if you want to come to Empty Cloud Monastery, yeah, we don't charge you and we don't, you know, uh, like we offer free hospitality, but you gotta, you know, you have to like follow the schedule. <laughs> You can't just come in and <laughs> take a reward. You have to do the work period. You have to do this. You know, there's a lot of incredible, this perfection of generosity. And also, you know, usually um, the people that come here, <laughs> yeah, there's lots of different things that they do in support of the Sangha. It's not the other way around. So I was like, Oh, wow so it's really interesting isn't it and yeah so all of this is a learning opportunity for me to also understand certain things so I don't know if I answered your question um, but I'm also curious to hear about your perspective as well oh no yeah. thank you it's very very revealing um, of what you talk about. Um, in my case, it was a having come from a very intensely Catholic upbringing, uh, and my mother, on my father's death, Terry, I'm afraid you froze a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Is that right. a poss possibly turn the video off? Maybe we can see in uh, if someone else has a question and then once Terry gets unfrozen. <laughs> or if anyone has a comment as well. I think. Well, I might have a comment. <laughs> Um, because uh, I find it very interesting that you spoke about uh, Franz von Assisi. Uh, I read a biography from Adolf Holl, uh, mm. The Last Christ. Uh, it's, it's, it exists in English. Uh, I read it in German, obviously. Uh, he, is a, he was a priest. He wrote Jesus in Bad Company uh, and was not allowed to be a priest anymore, uh, but was very intellectual. And in the end, he, he, became, he, he, he stayed a Catholic. Uh, but he liked Buddhism very much. He wrote about books about various things. Uh, and the biography uh, was very interesting because um, what I knew before was that he spoke with birds. But in his real life, the scriptures which survived, uh, they were burned after his death, uh, but they still survived. Uh, that was possibly one small thing which might into it, but he was radically for non-possession and radically 100% helping other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but even before he died, um, the order already, because of the Catholic, Catholic Church, basically forced that officially they can own things. And there was already a big church where his son was buried, which he never wanted. And um, for me, don't you think he, he was basically, we can say he was a Buddhist without knowing it, like various people have the feeling, do exactly what Buddhism is, they don't know it. And many, some other people say they are Buddhist and they don't really see much of, of, uh, <laughs> of, of it in, in, in their acting. Mm. 
Yeah, thank you, Gunter. I feel, you know, we use all these <laughs> sometimes labels like that's Buddhist, that's Catholic, etc. I feel like uh, if we say if this is in accordance with Dhamma or not in accordance with Dhamma, that might be a little bit more useful uh, just because there is uh, sometimes, um, you know, us Buddhists can do some things that are really not in accordance with Dhamma, uh, but we're still Buddhist, right? <laughs> so a lot of Buddhist, right? So, so I feel like, yeah, we can appreciate, as I was saying, there's... Um, uh, lots of different um, things that Catholic brothers and sisters, uh, monastic and non-monastic lay people and ordained people do that are very much in accordance with Dhamma. So if that is the definition of Buddhist, then I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, but to say that something is is Buddhist per se, like or I mean, I feel like there is elements of of the Dhamma everywhere, right? So there's elements of the Dhamma in Catholicism, there's elements of the Dhamma in Islam, there's elements of the Dhamma in um, Hinduism, there's elements of the Dhamma everywhere. And there's also elements of Adhamma in, uh, in Catholicism, there's elements of Adhamma in uh, Islam, there's um, Hinduism and so forth. And there's elements of Adhamma also in what we call today Buddhism. So that's what we need to actually, I think, really understand uh, in our own practice that I think is a more interesting question, at least for myself, uh, to, to really identify what is Dhamma and what is Adhamma. And, you know, it's not just sufficient to say I follow the suttas and I follow the Vinaya because actually uh, we're just following an oral tradition. And as we see, you know, multiple times, um, the Buddha has been recorded to say that, you know, there are some uh, things that are transmitted, that are accurate, that are in accordance with Dhamma, and some that are not uh, transmitted properly in accordance with Dhamma. So that's really the bulk of the work. And what I find very fascinating of getting in touch with different traditions is that we are somewhat a little bit more objective with others. Um, at least I am. You know, when I find when I'm interacting with the Catholics or where I'm interacting with Muslim people or where I'm interacting with um, a religion that I don't call my own, it's very clear to me. You know, if someone is being, for example, oppressed, right? <laughs> I'm kind of like, yeah. I mean, no matter how you justify it, with like your religious scripture <laughs> that is just wrong <laughs> or that is right right and like you know I can kind of I'm, it takes me not even a second to determine that but when it gets into the into my religion into my scriptures and to the things that I hold dear and clear like to the heart then that's actually paradoxically where I become a little bit more confused and I'm like oh but maybe there is a reason why there is this or maybe I should be practicing in this way rather than the other like the mind or other people also start going oh but there is that scripture or there is that text and so that becomes very dodgy <laughs> And so that's more the what I find very actually refreshing with interfaith work is to, um, yeah, notice those moments of my mind where I identify that and then go like, oh, that's no different in Buddhism. And, and then try to, to use that same third person perspective when dealing with, um, with what I need to recognize um, as Dhamma or what I need to recognize as Adhamma. So these are few yeah. uh, I will ask Terry if you, uh, I will ask you to unmute again. If I can press it. Now it's pressed. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. Very good. Do you want to continue? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure how much of what I said you gathered because uh, my computer went into freeze, and I wasn't sure what what I what I what how much of what I said you actually um, repeat everything because we didn't. <laughs> oh, it was just that I came from a very intense uh, Catholic background, 
Um, and when my my, my mother, when my father died, my mother entered a religious order as a religious sister, the Benedict order. And all my friends were Catholics. My life was Catholic. But it was only when I went to a out of sure, pure curiosity and interest of learning about Buddhism as a movement across Asia. And, Buddha, and meditation was spoken about that I realized that meditation was something that I'd been looking for myself. And that led to becoming much more aware and much more taking Buddhist ideas and trying to find out more about it. So mm. it was so really interesting to hear how you were talking about it. But for myself, I had to, uh, I'd look at in retrospect, had to allow my mother to die first. This is a trans uh, fur of thought processes that would have been beyond her comprehension. Mm. It would be like denying my culture, my mm. ethnicity. Uh, so yes, I was just, it's its interesting how people come to Buddhism, especially from a, a Western background. So thank you for talking with, talk, uh, sharing with us. Thank you so much, Terry, for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, I have to say, yeah, of course, there is a lot, obviously, um, that is dear to us with everything that we are raised with. And I have to say, actually, that I'm also grateful to Buddhism for that. I'm very grateful to the Dhamma for that, to actually have been, made me come to peace, actually, with Catholicism. <laughs> I actually appreciate it so much more now than I've ever appreciated it <laughs> growing up. <laughs> actually now I'm kind of like oh wow you know I um I hope these churches don't all turn into museums I hope they all don't like uh stop operating as spiritual places I hope that actually people keep practicing um Catholicism as a matter of fact actually I've even been telling people when I, when I was there you know very very inspired by the Buddha <laughs> with the general Siha <laughs> Uh, I was like, yeah, no, you should just keep on also um, taking care of the your local churches, taking care of all of these spiritual places, because I've also understood the incredible benefit that all of this has um, has created, uh, and it's and that's also probably you know one of the conditions that brought me to the Dhamma that made it easier for me to understand the Dhamma. You know, there's also the gradual training. So we have the gradual training on uh, on giving. <laughs> well, I, I have that. <laughs> I have gradual training on sila. Mostly have that. I have to perfect a few points here and there, like include all sentient beings rather than just humans and non-killing. But, you know, that was like at least the major one I got. <laughs> Okay, so there's lots to appreciate. What I'm trying to say is that all of that creates the foundations for, um, yeah, the gradual training of the Buddha. So then that, you know, also the, the there's lots of, once again, teachings on renunciation in, in Catholicism, for example. So, so that you're one head, one step ahead. <laughs> it wasn't foreign to me, actually, I had already like practiced in that way. So then, yeah, all of that creates very solid wonderful conditions to to receive the other um deep teachings as you said uh like the wisdom teachings the bhavana teachings um where especially in the teachings of the buddha they're spelled out so clearly so so clearly and um yeah so we we can just really taste it and 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 cultivate it so yeah thank you for sharing that Thank you. Okay, I think we're two minutes late, which is, you know, I'm Italian, so that's very much in, in, in line with the cultural stereotypes. <laughs> She's only two minutes late. <laughs> so we can uh, end uh, our evening together with uh, three sadhus, and I'm so happy that we had the opportunity to practice uh, together. Uh, tonight and I think I'll see you again next month at a certain point so I wish you to all be well happy and peaceful and to grow in Dhamma and may you all attain blissful supreme enlightenment 
Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Actually, yes, I'll just.